Hello, and welcome to the Allen Press webinar, Rethinking Author Instructions. I'm Joanna Gillette, Product Marketing Manager here at Allen Press, and I'll be your host today. On your screen, you should see some general information about participating in today's webinar. I'll go over a few of these items very quickly before we get started. Our presenter, Amanda, will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. So if you do have questions, please use the chat function of WebEx to direct them to the webinar host, which is me, during the presentation. We're using VoiceOver IP technology to broadcast the audio for today's webinar. So if you're having trouble hearing, please make sure the volume is turned up on your PC. VoiceOver IP quality may vary depending on network traffic. If you are having trouble hearing, please call in to listen to the webinar over the teleconference line. The toll-free telephone number and participant passcode for the conference line are listed next to the green telephone icon on this slide. If you do call into the conference line, please be sure to mute your telephone. You can continue the conversation with us and your fellow attendees after the webinar using the Discussions tab of the Allen, Allen Press Facebook page. Here you can post a comment, share an idea, or ask a question. Of course, we also encourage attendees to, chat, um, to tweet during and after the event using the hashtag APWeb26. Today, Amanda Heather will share best practices for author guidelines. She'll discuss recommendations for reviewing and maintaining your guidelines, and ideas for educating authors, getting your staff on board, and evaluating the utility of your author materials. Amanda Heather, Heather is the Manager of Client Solutions here at Allen Press. She's been working with Allen Press for more than four years. Amanda answers requests for proposals and works with customers on solutions for everything from workflow changes to emerging technology. I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Amanda now, and don't forget to send me your questions as we go along. All right, hello everyone. We've put together some best practices when writing, updating, or creating your author guidelines. Some of these will feel obvious, but I think if you take a few minutes to really think about each practice and how or if you've accomplished it in the last year or even two years, you may find some places for improvement. In today's presentation, we're going to go through the following best practices. Reviewing your guidelines on a schedule. The location of your guidelines. Marketing to your authors. Author education. Staff buy-in and gathering metrics on your author guidelines. Review your guidelines on a schedule. I feel like this is the most important and a lot of times the most overlooked. Again, I know some of this may feel like common sense, but when was the last time you did a thorough review of your author guidelines? I really recommend doing a review once a year and definitely after in implementing any workflow changes. Put it on your project plan so you make sure someone is taking a look at your guidelines and updating them appropriately. Technology changes quickly, and as your editorial workflow adapts with new industry trends, your guidelines need to adapt as well. Remember, it's not just about print anymore. Are you requiring an ORCID? Are, do you accept supplemental materials? If so, make sure they are prominent as this is a commonly overlooked option and many times buried deep within the guidelines. With online publishing, word and page limits budgets have changed. Have you yours? Start by asking yourself and your staff some questions to help get the review started. What new processes have been put into place within your editorial office? What new services are you offering? Maybe you've just implemented an online peer review system. Now you won't need three hard copies of each manuscript mailed to the editor anymore. Have you changed vendors recently? What one requires, the other may not. So be sure to ask for the vendor's manuscript submission guidelines. When doing your review, also make sure to look for outdated instructions hidden within your documents. We see some of these common outdated instructions still in author guidelines. Underline words that you would like to appear in italics. Obviously, this is no longer necessary as it's geared towards a hard copy and not an online submission. Look for things like, if lettering is required on an image, rub-on letters are preferred over other types of labels that require glue and paper. Please send nine and a half, nine by 12 envelopes with sufficient unattached postage for mailing hard copies to reviewers. 
While these mistakes may seem like they are not a big deal and should be obvious to the author as a mistake, you have just lost your author's attention. They aren't going to take your guidelines seriously or assume that they're completely out of date and just submit what they already have. More than one person should take a look at the guidelines. If possible, a person from outside of the society for a fresh perspective. Maybe an author that is not previously submitted. You could put them out to your members, colleagues, friends, enough people that you are confident in the instructions when they are published. Gather feedback using specific questions or a survey, like SurveyMonkey, so you can accurately gauge the readability of the guidelines. My recommendations for these questions would be to think about what your specific pain points are with manuscripts fresh in the door and gear your survey questions in that direction. Sample questions might be, can you format a reference in the style specified in our guideline? What is the charge for a color figure and open access? See if your reviewers can answer your questions correctly and quickly. You could also do a form or ask the reviewer to fill out a form that you've put together. Having a structured feedback can help you really identify where you may still need to update your guidelines. So some guidelines for your guidelines. While you review your guidelines, take a moment to also review your internal procedures for author guidelines. Make sure to document within your editorial office who has the responsibility of reviewing these guidelines and when you decide to review them, and then who should update them. Due to volunteer positions and turnover, some societies are not sure who made the original or where it resides and end up starting from scratch. While this could be a good exercise to recreate the entire instruction and just start from scratch, you don't want to have to do that every time. Some questions to answer in your internal instruction document are, where are they posted? Who's responsible for posting them? And are they also printed in the journal? Are they online? Where are they at online? Finally, if during your review you are struggling with what, if any updates should be made, or are not sure if a requirement is necessary, ask your composition or production, production services vendor. They will be able to tell you if it is really a necessary instruction anymore. If you're an Allen Press customer, you can contact your account manager and they can review your guidelines and offer some constructive feedback. When you take a close look at your guidelines, make sure you are looking at all of your guidelines. Many journals have their author guidelines located in several places, the peer review site, the society site, the online site, and so on. The best practice is to only post them on one site and have all other sites or locations linked back to the single PDF or static web page with the instructions. Even if you think you know where they are, do a quick internet search for your journal guidelines. You may be surprised where they are lurking. Legacy guidelines can lurk in unexpected places, including past publisher websites, old business sites, and other internet nooks and crannies. We actually had an author dispute charges because they found author guidelines from years ago with different lower prices on an old publisher's site. Marketing to your authors. The truth is journals are in competition for authors and high quality papers. You want to make sure your journal is the obvious choice for an author. Use your guidelines as a first impression to the author. If they're not a member, this may be one of the first touches they have with your journal or even your society. The last thing you want to do is frustrate them with unreasonable or outdated requests. This may cause them to look at competitor journals and submit somewhere else. I am absolutely not saying you should lower your standards. Just take a hard look at your guidelines. Are there some legacy guidelines that you can eliminate? Things that aren't necessary but have always been required. Maybe there are requirements that aren't going to cause you pain and time and aren't required by your vendor that can be removed. One less, one less obstacle to an author won't cause your office a problem and won't damage the science. And it can help your reputation as a journal that is easy to work with and in touch with its authors. I like this quote when considering author guidelines. The definition of genius is taking the complex and making it simple by Albert Einstein. Your guidelines should be easy for the author to read and to find the information they need. I think we can all assume they're not going to read through 19 pages of straight text cover to cover and then submit their manuscript. 
they're going to hunt and peck for the information they need. They already have a manuscript in front of them, and they're trying to find the information they need to get their manuscript submitted and pass peer review with the least resistance possible. For guideline organization, keep the most important information at the top, the most important to you and to the authors. Author charges, disclaimers, patient waivers, etc., should have a prominent position in your guidelines and be towards the front of the document rather than scattered throughout or at the very end. I'm sure you've all heard the urban legend of our industry. An editor with really long guidelines hit a line towards the end that said, congratulations, if you've read this far, contact the editorial office for a prize. I think it's pretty telling that this story always ends with, and no one ever contacted him. Keeping this in mind, I recommend you keep your guidelines as short as possible. Best practice is around five pages maximum. Any more than that, and the authors will only hunt and peck for what they think is the most important. For your guideline layout, use headers and white space to increase the readability of the document. This basic sample shows some white space to the left and headers to draw the eye. Make the guidelines easy for the eye to follow. Bullet points or an author checklist can help the author get their submission organized and in turn get the editorial office what it needs. For longer guidelines, consider using a linked TOC at the top of the web page or PDF for ease of navigation. This way it's easy for the author to find the information they need to complete their submission. Another good online model we see for guidelines is to create a web page with the most important information and then have a link to a longer guideline or additional instructions should the author need more in-depth information or even examples. The majority of publications are posting author guidelines online, and that means you're no longer constrained to the printed page. Feel free to get creative and post links to your YouTube videos or place informa informative graphics on the page. Include visual cues to the authors. Depending on your instructions, maybe consider a YouTube video embedded in the text. The video I've put on this slide is on the Society for Range Management's online journal site. There are two videos here discussing who the rangeland's audience is, professionals in the field rather than scientists, and how the paper should be written to appeal to that readership. YouTube and other graphics could also be particularly useful for an ESL author. You could use pictures or poll quotes to make information stand out for authors. Depending on how the instructions are hosted, you may be free from an 8.5 by 11 layout and able to really have some design freedom. Clickable expanding sections may be a great option for you to have if you have long instructions. Just keep in mind you're going for readability and quick understanding for your authors. Take a look at your competition. If you have completely different guidelines, what is your reasoning for the differences? Are the differences the legacy instructions that are outdated that we touched on earlier? How long are their guidelines? Are they formatted so that the author can easily find what they need? Did they use any of the fun YouTube graphics, YouTube graphics, checklists, or any other methods to get their instructions understood? As a whole, take a look at how far off are your guidelines from some of your key competitors. If you are way off the standard, you are probably making your author rewrite the manuscript before submission. And the author is probably doing this at 2 or 3 in the morning. Believe it or not, we can tell when an author has stayed up late and worked on a submission. They are usually the messiest manuscripts we process. And sure enough, when we check the file stamp, it was saved at 2 a.m. For author education, take a look and review of your reorganization of your guidelines as a way to educate your authors. This will reduce the time you spend following up with them for information and result in better submissions. Clearly state what you expect from a submission. This lies in the organization of the guidelines as we discussed earlier, but also in giving the author information. The author guidelines shouldn't just be about what the author is responsible for, it should also state what the editorial office is responsible for doing to the manuscript. Again, a checklist is a valuable tool for an author in the editorial office. This is a great way of giving them a tool which will ultimately help you. The checklist can include necessary formatting, forms to be signed, supplemental files included in submission, and more. 
It is an easy and very visual way of helping the author organize their submission. Give ESL authors resources for their submission. These can be the YouTube videos we talked about earlier, links to independent translation services, or anything else you think would help equip them and ultimately the editorial office with a better end product. Let your authors know what to expect. Give them typical review time so they have an idea of when they can expect to hear back. But be realistic and remember, we're marketing to them in hopes of attracting their future high quality submissions back again. Let them know what's going to happen to their submission. Will you be running it through plagiarism software? How do you handle your NIH deposits? Be clear on what is expected of the author and what the editorial office will do on their behalf. Again, this is a great thing for a checklist. Explain the ORC ID. Do you require it? Do you recommend they have it? Provide some links for them to the ORCID site so that they can see what it's all about and sign up, especially if it's necessary. For green open access requirements, there's not a concrete standard in the industry yet, so take out time to do a search and see what other societies are doing to see which model may be best for your, to suit your journal. And then clearly explain this policy in your guideline for your author. Preprints are called a lot of different things in our authors, in our industry. Issue in progress, publish ahead of print, papers in progress, and many others. If your guidelines, in your guidelines, be very clear when using your name for preprints, what they are, and when they will be posted online in ahead of production. This is sometimes a nasty surprise for authors. State clearly the consequences for not following the guidelines. I really recommend you take a hard look at your guidelines and make sure they're completely necessary before lining out your consequences. Make sure that cost timelines for author charges as a consequence and in general are clearly outlined and communicated for your authors. Nothing will frustrate an author more than unexpected charges. Make sure it's clear they will have to pay and when they will have to pay in the process. Some consequences that we typically see are delayed publication, charges to the author, and in some cases, complete rejection. Again, make sure the consequence fits the crime. Consider your editorial office and society organization and association culture. Will you take the paper if it's not formatted according to your author's instructions? If you have a history of taking papers, it's going to be hard to turn around and draw a hard line after years of doing the opposite. Instead, consider what are the key things that cause your editorial office pain that must be followed and only put those in your guidelines. You will have more authors comply with guidelines that are shorter in length and therefore easier to follow. Along these lines, make sure that whatever you decide to do, everyone involved with the journal buys in. Don't have an editorial assistant refuse to admit a paper that didn't follow instructions if the author can just go around the first line of defense and get approval. Of course, there will be special circumstances, but they should be just that, special and rare. Everyone should understand why those guidelines are in place so they can provide valuable feedback to your authors. State your expectations, consequences, and stay firm as a team. After you've reviewed your author guidelines, track your manuscript submissions. Are you still getting incorrect submissions? What specifically is happening? Is it the references? If you've seen some areas improve and others stay painful, take another look. Talk to your vendor and see if they have suggestions. Have an outside person take a look. Ask the authors nicely why they had an issue with an area of their submission or if they have any feedback on the experience. Gathering the metrics and investigating root causes will help you keep a keen eye on what is continuing to elude your authors and what you have been able to fix. This would be a great time to consider other ways to present the information as well. If references are giving you particular trouble, consider screenshots or examples. Maybe the YouTube video is more appropriate for your audience. Gathering these metrics can be as easy as keeping a spreadsheet with columns for typical, typical problems you have now and checking to see if they're still happening. So in summary, by adopting some or all of these best practices we have reviewed today, we'll make both the editorial office and authors more comfortable with the entire experience. To do a quick recap, your best practices are review your guidelines on a schedule, 
once a year, but absolutely after any workflow or editorial office procedural changes. Check your author guideline location when you review them and initial check for any outliers on any old sites and then maybe a quick check from then on to make sure they haven't been put anywhere else. Create your guidelines with an eye to marketing to your authors. It's a competitive market for high quality authors and you want them to submit to your journal, not your competitors. Educate your authors with your guidelines, giving them information they need and a reason you need what is outlined in the guidelines. Work with your staff so that they can understand the guidelines and the reasons behind them. This will enable them to push back to the authors and not let problem manuscripts pass. Gather metrics on your guidelines, especially after making any changes, to keep an eye on anything that is continuing to be unclear. This way you can make appropriate changes quickly. And I just wanted to again mention, for Allen Press customers, don't hesitate to contact your account manager to ask for a review or advice for your guidelines. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joanna. Thanks, Amanda. Um, that's great. Um, we have, I want to mention a couple of things before we start in on the questions. Several people have asked about whether or not the slides will be available after the presentation. Um, and we will be posting those on our website later this week. Um, and then I know some of you also had some difficulties with audio this morning. We had a record number of attendees, and I think that may have affected our bandwidth a little bit. So um, I'm sorry if you did have trouble, and um, you may want to catch the video if you missed um, pieces of Amanda's presentation. So I do have um, quite a few questions. Early on, you made a comment about graphics and um, links to, to um, help people figure out what they should be doing with graphics. Can you expand a little bit more on uh, what you were thinking there? So um, I know that there are some folks who do, um, you know, you could definitely post examples of graphics if there's a particular way that you want, you know, typeset in your graphics and that type of thing. So posting to an example would be a great idea. And then some people also use um, like figure checking software that would be good to, to check out. Another graphic might be um, a screenshot, like if you have a reference um, layout that you want to use, you know, some screenshots could be helpful to people as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so also, Amanda, what do you think about um, best practices for communicating that you're going to do a plagiarism check? I think that needs to be clear in your guidelines. I think it should probably be prominent towards the top of it um, and any special requirements you might have for that plagiarism check depending on how you're going to do it. Um, so someone else commented that they um, find it kind of difficult to measure the effects of any changes that they make in their author guidelines. Um, so can you maybe expand a little bit more on, um, you know, how you can kind of keep track of those types of things um, and, you know, keep track of whether a change has made a difference or not. I think you maybe suggested using a spreadsheet to track, you know, potential problems before you change your guidelines, making a change, and then seeing if those same problems crop up again. Yeah, just something as simple as putting, you know, what is bothering you with your references and then making a check every time a submission comes in, is it still incorrect? And if it is, you know, talking to your vendor or even asking your authors nicely for some feedback. Um, so, Amanda, have you seen um, many publishers posting author guidelines on their website as PDFs or are they mostly just part of their website posted as an HTML page? You know, I'm seeing both. I see um, both of them are happening. Some people are doing an HTML that's uh, shorter, like I mentioned earlier, and then they have a quick link out to like a larger document with more in-depth instructions. And I think that's a great way for showing what's, what's um, most important to your authors. Yeah, it's a great idea to have like the basics up front and then click in for more detail. That way, you know, people can get and detail what they want to. Someone else was asking about just kind of, you know, some of their most complicated instructions are, are around figures, and um, I think that's a great suggestion for posting the basics and then, you know, having people kind of click down to, to find more detailed instructions about figures if they need additional help. Right. Um, so here's a question. Do you allow authors to negotiate terms, or are you seeing that people do allow authors to kind of negotiate on the author terms or are most people kind of standing firm? Um, I think it really depends again on your organization's culture. Some people are standing firm and um, we're seeing 
probably the most common thing is like fee waivers and that. Yeah, fee waivers for invited papers, that kind of thing. Or then um, another example I think I've seen is, um, you know, can I reuse something that's been published in a previous paper before? And you may have really stringent guidelines on that, but in some circumstances, you may want to allow bits and pieces based on what's been, you know, already published in an institutional repository. So, okay, we're getting in lots of questions. So how helpful are article templates for helping authors to provide all the information they need to include, things like their full name, degrees, titles, seem to cause common problems as this information is on the article submission and peer review software, so it's not being included in the actual manuscript. I think there are kind of two schools of thought on this. Some people would say that um, if that information is provided as metadata in the peer review software, that it shouldn't be part of the manuscript and you should be getting it from the metadata so you have a single place to um, correct it. If that's not your school of thought and you do want all of that information still included in um, the actual manuscript, that's something you'll want to be very clear about in your instructions. And I would recommend even um, putting a note about that in your peer review software at that stage, making sure that that's really obvious because that's something that is going to be pretty different from um, publication to publication. Um, so, Question about checklists. Are these typically placed in the web instructions? Should they be required to be sent in with the submission, or are they just really there for the author um, to make sure they've done all the requisite things? I think they're really just there for um, the author to make sure they've done the requisite things. Um, you can do them in a variety of ways. You know, a PDF might be a good idea, so it's easy for the author to print it out, especially, you know, that way they can actually physically mark it off or take notes on it. So I think that'd be a good way to do it. Um, but you could also do it actually just within the guidelines as well if you're trying to function it as a bullet list and a checklist. So um, we've also had someone ask for a model of well-designed instructions in HTML to point people to, um, to the things that include click out some more in-depth information. We could probably find a good example to send out and um, we'll take down the name of that, that questioner and make sure we get you some more information about that. And we'll also probably tweet it. So be sure to check Twitter. I'm just scanning to make sure I haven't missed anybody's questions. They are coming in kind of rapid fire today. Um, and I think it looks like that's it for our questions today. So um, anyhow, I want to thank Amanda and all of the attendees for today's webinar. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and that you can put some of Amanda's suggestions into practice to improve the author guidelines for your publication. We'll be sending out a brief survey that will include links to both the slides and a video recording of today's session. So please do take a few moments to complete the survey. We're always looking for feedback and how we can improve future webinars as well as suggestions for future topics. And don't forget, you can continue the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. That concludes our session for today. Thanks very much for coming.